to adult story time with Lucian. <laughs> ah, everything looks good. How's everything over there in the record world? You're looking good over there, yeah? Record world looks like it's in trouble. Upload world looks good. Give me a thumbs up. Yeah, all right. All right, this crew member over here, I'm, I'm afraid you're going to have to restart, bro. Yeah. You need to do that again. Because you're all... Okay, well, if you're still outputting, that's fine. All right, well, we'll see. I don't think you're recording, but it says you're recording. So we'll see. Either way. Okay. Well, first let me take a sip so I don't get dry mouth. <clears throat> Choke on you like I did last or earlier today. Because what time is it? It's 9.01 and 30 seconds. So 90 seconds into it. Yeah, I know you guys don't. Of course, at least, you know, I got my um, sound effects machine <laughs> up and running. Can you tell? Yeah, it's true. You can. All right. Here we go. We got to start the records up again because they got lost. There we go. Okay. I think it's working. It may not be. Eh, whatever. It's been finicky all day. It doesn't like the new SDI cable I gave it. That's okay. Well, okay, are we ready? Yes. Is it getting exciting for you? Have you have you guessed who my favorite character is? in this chapter yet. Okay, well, let's back up. I'll bring you up to date. Here, wait, let's press my one button to bring up my reading. There we go. We'll stop that one, reset it, and we'll get ready to start that one. All right, are we ready? Are you sure? All right, I'm going to read to bring you up like we do all the time, every day, every night. Ready? Suddenly, JL got a worried look on his face as he stared at Marty say, his mind began to race with thoughts. His eyes got a far-off look as he mentally ran down a tangent, and he was suddenly lost in a daydream. When he did this, his eyes subconsciously drifted down a few inches and stopped on Marise's chest. Yeah, that was just annoying me again. Something's wrong with the gate on the compressor, too, because that shouldn't be happening. When he did this, his eyes subconsciously drifted down a few inches and stopped on Marise's chest. Hmm. I'd not actually counted on the possibility this new roommate might be crazy. That's where we stopped. So now, ready? Start the timer. And the timer is away. I just knew she was a woman. I wonder if there might be a connection between the two states of existence. You know, woman and crazy. Hmm. I should look into that sometime. Anyway, maybe later. Now, back to the dark-haired new roomie and, whoa, hello, hooties. Wow, this girl is actually quite hot, and she's in a very loose tank top. And suddenly, I'm thinking I could live with a little bit of crazy for a peek at those honkers. JL had to try hard to look up from her cleavage. When he did, he found Marise looking straight at him. The last thing he remembered seeing was her smiling at him. He didn't realize he just said that entire thought out loud. Everything from the crazy roommate part to the honkers. And fortunately for him, he also didn't remember when his brain blocked out the next instant, as Marty say, punched him in the jaw and knocked him out cold. And that is the end of the chapter, chapter 16. Now, chapter 17. Modern timeline. See all the ones with the T minus? That's modern timeline. Okay. Just a little code lets you in on that. T minus 45 hours, zero minutes. Location Mayan Archaeological Dig, Yucatan. Date December 19th, 2012 AD. Local time 3 07 p.m. 
Global Reference Time, 2107 GMT. Marise was getting tired of leaving her callback number. This number was supposed to get him, not some answering service. When she did see him again, she was going to remind him of a few things. Marise was working on becoming a tenured professor at Mexico University. Water. <clears throat> there we go. Almost four years ago, she went to give a presentation at her alma mater, the University of Miami. While she was there, she ran into her old dormitory roommate. Actually, they had been roommates for all of Marise's time at the university. After they had after they had spent three years in the dorm together, they shared an apartment near campus for the final two years that Marise needed to finish her Ph.D. in archaeology. She got her Ph.D. at the same ceremony that J.L. finally got his bachelor's degree in general studies. He wouldn't have gotten it without Marise's help. When she met up with him again after her presentation, he was still hanging around the campus, Although in a totally new capacity, she'd read some of the articles and tried to follow the news stories. She knew that he had several honorary doctorates now, which always made her smile. It was the only way you ever would have gotten one, she told him while laughing out loud, after he sheepishly informed her his Ph.D. status, informed her of his Ph.D. status. She also knew he had more than five of them now. Somehow, she always found out when something great happened to J.L. She also knew Johnston Lionel Farnsworth III better than anyone else, even better than his mom, who was his only living relative. Suddenly, a woman's voice came over the satellite telephone receiver against Marise's ear. I'm sorry, Dr. Dr. Sanchez. Dr. Farnsworth is not available at the moment. If you'd like to leave another message... The woman on the other end was hoping that Marise would say no this time, unlike the last 12 times she called in the past half hour. Marise obliged her. No, I'll just wait for his call back. Thank you again, Margaret. Marise had asked for the woman's name the first time she left a message. She knew it was better to be courteous to people you left messages with. Marise canceled the call on the receiver and looked up. She was standing on the top of the pyramid. She didn't have to do that to get reception. She just liked to do it. It was a satellite phone. They were mostly immune to the interference that had started to plague cell phones and some landline networks from the increased sunspot activity and solar storms lately, like the one just a few hours ago. The sat phone only had a problem from traffic, especially after one of those storms like today. As she looked at the phone, she thought to herself, Not one call for four weeks, and I just made 13 calls today. God, I can't wait to see the bill. But she quickly remembered she would actually tried to call J.L. over 60 times in the past 30 minutes. Most of the calls never made it through because of high volume on all the networks. I'll have to develop a plan B if I can't reach him, but for now... She interrupted her own thought. I'll wait for him to call back, she said out loud as she walked to the edge of the flat pyramid top. This pyramid wasn't like the ones in Egypt. Instead of having a pointed apex, this one was flat and wide at the peak, with a smooth stone surface that went from edge to edge on all four sides. The top surface was as big as a large room, just with no walls. Weeks ago, she had cleared the path up here through the overgrown vegetation covering the sides. The rest of the pyramid blended right into the actual jungle canopy and looked like a mountain peak with a flat-top haircut. Only the plaza between the two pyramids was fully cleared. It took almost a year to do it. As she turned a complete circle and surveyed the canopy, She could just make out the four raised gravel roads which led out of the complex like the cardinal directions on a gigantic compass. The roads were almost perfectly aligned with the magnetic directions during the time when they were built. The strange roads had been covered over by centuries of growth, 
but when cleared, the overgrowth revealed amazingly flat and straight gravel roads. Although Matisse was able to determine the period of time when they were constructed, she had no idea why the roads were built, but they were made to last. Matisse walked over to the other edge of the stone pyramid top and looked out over the jungle. Then she looked down at the smooth rock surface under her feet again. The stone top was almost perfectly square and flat. Even after settling over the millennia, this stone platform was still flat and level. That was also a mystery. The exterior of the pyramid had obviously settled and been overgrown during the time since the first stone was laid in this man-made mountain. But the center section had remained unchanged. There were parts of the sides where the exterior walls had subsided down slightly away from the massive four-sided central column of stone. <coughs> Marise was now standing on top of that column. She had no way of knowing, but the central substructure she was standing on was a solid stone frame and truss system that went to the very bottom of the ancient pyramid. She also had no way of knowing this stone was poured, not quarried. Using an ancient natural concrete recipe that didn't require the lime used today, the Mesoamerican cultures who started this pyramid poured the foundation over 10,000 years ago. Each culture that added to the man-made mountain slowly created a solid stone structure that went from under Marise's feet all the way into the bedrock several hundred feet below. Maybe it had a temple structure on it at one time, she thought as she looked around the stone square. Just then, the satellite phone she was absent-mindedly holding in her hand began to ring. Well, it's about damn time, she blurted out to herself. Then she pressed the talk button on the satellite phone for the 67th time that day. She already knew the hell she was going to catch over the bill when she had to go back to Mexico University next month. She almost yelled at the receiver. This is Dr. Sanchez. Nothing on the other end. She tried again. Hello? There was a slight buzzing on the line, then a woman's voice. Hello, Dr. Sanchez, this is Margaret, Dr. Farnsworth's personal assistant. We just spoke a minute ago. Marise suddenly realized she'd been speaking to his assistant, not some lame answering service. Okay. I won't kill him when I see him, she quickly thought to herself as Margaret kept going. I finally reached him for you. He's on the other line. Hold while I transfer you, okay? Margaret wasn't sure if Marise was still on the line. Yes, thank you, Margaret. I'll hold. Then Marise heard jazz music start playing on the line. JL always liked jazz. Suddenly, the line got extremely noisy, like at an airport outside on the tarmac next to a jet engine. She was close in her guess. JL was jumping out of his corporate jet helicopter. He was wearing a wireless Bluetooth headset and was talking out of the rotor wash. And was walking out of the rotor wash, excuse me. When he cleared the blades, the helicopter revved its engines and took off quickly. The sound began to fade. Then JL came on the line. Marty say Margaret said you've been trying to reach me. Sorry about that. I was out of the office this morning. Can you hold on for a second? Marise didn't want to, but she agreed. Then she heard some noise and movement in the background. She could barely make out JL talking, but he was not talking to her. Is this thing on? Someone else answered in the background. Yes, sir. Suddenly, Marise could hear JL clearly because he began yelling through a powered megaphone. Attention, Royal Guards! This is your king! Tell President Smith and his band of Barney Fife University rent cops that if he crosses that 40-foot moat, I'll have him arrested and charged with spying. Then I'll have him hung by royal executive orders from... Just a minute. J.L. started looking for an appropriate hangman's yard arm for royal execution hangings. He settled on one, then pointed to a large oak tree in the middle of the golf course turned research park. Then he shouted into the megaphone again. 
That large tree over there. Then he had an afterthought. And tell Dr. Smith I will be at the grand opening ceremony tonight at 9 p.m. sharp. Tell him not to be late. And tell him to bring his lovely wife, Martha, too. I miss talking to her. Across the large, empty lot in front of the entry drive onto the university property was a line of brightly colored guards for the Palace Research Park. <coughs> Excuse me. The name of the quickly growing technology mecca. The 12 men stood in a line, shoulder to shoulder, with drawn swords held across their chest. In front of them, across a shallow ditch, was an older, thin man, the University of Miami president, John Smith. The Miami sun was still bright and hot in December, and the university president was stewing in his three-piece custom-tailored suit. But not because of the bright sun that was on the same equatorial parallel as Mexico. And not because he couldn't hear Johnston Lionel Farnsworth III, the current and long-standing bane of this man's existence, at least as far as President Smith was concerned. The leader of the private security guards hired to protect the property started to repeat the instructions given to him by his boss. Sir, do not attempt to cross the moat. The president of the university snapped at the brightly covered guard. I can hear him just fine. Then he yelled past the line of guards towards D toward JL. Mr. Farnsworth, I'm over this nonsense and I'm not going to stand for it any longer. You and I are going to settle this right now. The president started walking toward the shallow hill made of black concrete with sparkles in it. He didn't notice the solid stone sentry columns that sat every 10 meters around the perimeter of the research park and on both sides of the entryway. But they noticed him. The spherical top of the two sentry columns that were flanking the area the angry university president was approaching swung silently toward their prey. They had long since locked onto the moving target with military grade tracking systems. As the president crossed the bright yellow line that was painted on the street where the university property abutted the former golf community, the high power lasers in the sentry head fired a silent and invisible set of beams across the path directly in front of the administrator of the adjacent college. President John Smith heard the sound and stopped walking just before his foot crossed the painted red line and touched the surface of the black sparkly material. The high energy laser beams hit a few feet away from him on the beginning of the shallow hill made of the special energy absorbing concrete. It was actually the purpose of the high-tech moat, which now surrounded the entire perimeter of the once beautiful and exclusive golf club, or country club golf course. We'll start right, stop right there. Okay. All right. That was good, huh? Except for me having to stop and have, take uh, drinks. Sorry about that. Scratchy throat. Oh. <laughs>
just as you fax the memo. Tonight's show was brought to you by Dread Pirate Lucian. He's the bad Lucian. <laughs> yeah.